Will you join me, please? We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another, Come, let us worship together. This morning's prelude and offertory are both Ukrainian folk songs, the country from which my maternal grandparents came from. We light this chalice in hope for a world community with a flame that is a spark in our beloved community. May this flame be a reminder of our aspirations despite our own imperfections and shortcomings. May we draw strength from this service to challenge ourselves to affirm and promote our principles. Please stand as you're willing and able and join in singing our hymn number 159, This Is My Song.
So today is our final Sunday dedicated to our sixth Unitarian Universalist principle, the goal of world community with peace, justice, and liberty for all. Our principles, all of them, are interrelated, and today we will focus on the intersection of peace, liberty, and justice for all with the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of, of existence of which we are all a part. We are also in the final week of our pledge drive, and as such, we will touch on a final point of Unitarian Universalist conviction. When we align our resources with our values, we can create great good in this world. Environmental degradation disproportionately impacts people living at the margins of power, specifically the poor and people of color and indigenous people. There is no peace, liberty, or justice for all until that is made right. Our worship services here at BUC are live streamed via Zoom, and then later they are posted to our Facebook page, and the internet is forever. So to protect the privacy of our children, we use pre-recorded times for all ages. There are other reasons like the fact that our current technical abilities are short, and our director of religious education works remotely from a distance, different time zone. For all of these reasons, we pre-record. When the story is over, Kids are invited to leave the sanctuary for religious education, and there are adults waiting for you in the back of the sanctuary to take you to your classroom. Hey, everyone. Today's story is adapted from The Worth of Cherry Blossoms by Sarah Conover in Kindness, a Treasury of Buddhist Wisdom for Children and Parents. Once long ago, there lived a Buddhist nun and poet named Rengetsu. Once on a pilgrimage in a, re a remote region, Rengetsu had hiked since noon without having passed through a single village. But at last, as dusk descended, she came upon a small settlement along a river bank. She knocked upon the door of an inn, humbly asking for a night's lodging, but the inn was already full. As she rested, stars appeared out of the advancing darkness. The village grew steadily more quiet. Ringetsu stopped and listened, her heart filled with warmth at the sounds of families enjoying their suppers fading into those of preparing for the night. Rangetsu was tired, but not discouraged, and she remembered that beyond the town, she had earlier spied a forgotten orchard with lush, soft grass beneath the trees. So she retraced her steps down the road and bedded down for the night under a cherry tree. Rangetsu breathed in the cool night air and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, she was awakened by a bright light upon her face. When her eyes opened, a hazy, snowy moon loomed in the cloudless sky. Directly above her, thousands of cherry blossoms had opened while she slept, and each flower now held bright moonlight in its petal cup. It was so lovely that Ringetsu gasped. She bowed towards the village, then towards the bright moon in the sky, giving thanks for this unexpected gift. Rengetsu then composed this poem. Turned away at the inn, I take this unkindness as grace, resting instead beneath the heavy moon and evening blossoms. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. 
One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's plate collection recipient is BUC's own Emerging Needs Fund. The, this fund is used to provide cash support for members of our congregation and others in need. This has been especially important during the past two years. If you are experiencing financial difficulty or other problems, please contact Reverend Mandy. Your offering can be given via cash or checks by mail using Venmo or through our website. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. come to the, the time in our service that we set aside for centering in prayer. And I just realized I didn't get the joys and sorrows book. Uh, is, there's none? Okay. Just want to be sure, you know, we're all a little rusty. We're getting back in the swing of things. We begin every week with the sharing of joys and sorrows from our congregation. And these are the ones that were submitted online. Uh, Abha Deering has reached a major milestone in her life. She has beaten Raina at Scrabble. <laughs> This is a major accomplishment, I suppose, since Raina could read. She has been winning consistently, so <laughs> well done, Abha. Sorry, Raina. Next from Jim and Cheryl Shuttle. Uh, they say, we are so happy to be back in person at BUC for these last few weeks before our move to Maryland at the end of April. They continue, the BUC community has been such an important part of our lives these past 36 years, and it's going to be hard to say goodbye. At the same time, we are excited to begin this next chapter in our lives, and especially to be able to live down the street from our son's family and our granddaughters. They close by saying, Michigan will always be home to us, 
and BUC will always hold a special place in our hearts. I can say you will always hold a special place in our hearts as well. And finally, from Barb Eschner and Dick Cantley. It says, we would like to uh, express profound gratitude for the person who came forward as Bob, Barb's altruistic donor at the Michigan Medicine Pair Donor Program. Yes. They continued, this compassionate person underwent months of testing to be clear to donate their kidney. Surgery is scheduled for May 18th, and when there will be two donors and two recipients operated on sequentially, the beauty of the paired donor program. Barb's incredibly generous donor is anonymous at this time and might choose to stay anonymous. But Dick and Barb invite this beloved community to join them in gratitude and every wish for our donors continued good health. And we know that it remains on everyone's mind today, the atrocities being committed in Ukraine. We hold that in our hearts as well. Today is the final Sunday of the month. It is our practice on the final Sunday to light candles in memory of our beloved dead and also for the concerns that remain on our hearts. When the time comes, you'll be invited to come up this aisle light your candle, please place your candle at the back of the basin and then return to your seat. You may light a candle for anyone you remember or anything that you hold in your heart today.
this morning as a community committed to love for this world, committed to love for each other, we gather as a people of faith and hope. We gather to hold each other and to provide comfort and love in this difficult world. We are keenly aware of the shortcomings of our species. We know that we have wrought destruction on our home. We know that we have wrought destruction on each other. But we know that there's more to it than that. We know that we have value as individuals and we have value as a species. We know that there is redemption in this world and that we can work to overcome our shortcomings, that we can heal this world through our actions, through our decisions, through our votes. We know that we can bring about change in this world because we've done it before. May we have the strength to do so again. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. When Reverend Mandy and I were preparing for today's service, she let me know she would be speaking about Theodore Parker. Parker is a good example of the contradictions between someone's positive attributes and where they fall short. I started to think, isn't this the case for any great leader? In fact, isn't this the case for all of us? Looking for a reading for today, I came across an article on theessentialbs.com. Uh, what can I say? 35 beloved historical figures who weren't as great as we remember. <laughs> I won't read all 35 of them, but a few snippets would suffice to get the idea. Quote, Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States, most famous for issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Even though he began the first steps in abolishing slavery, he wasn't so peachy keen. Lincoln was actually quite racist and regularly used slurs to describe African Americans. He even initially opposed the Emancipation Proclamation. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most influential men in history, but even he isn't without his faults. While many know about him plagiarizing his doctoral thesis, the most surprising aspect of his life is his frequent extramarital affairs. He reportedly had affairs with over 40 women. Nelson Mandela is undoubtedly a beloved historical figure, but his track record isn't clean. 
Many may not know that Mel Nelson Mandela co-founded Un Conto de Suisi, a group that's responsible for unlawful violence. The group has reportedly committed over 100 acts of sabotage, over 100 deaths, and other atrocious acts." End quote. If we cancel the good people, that, that good, the good that people have done because of their not so good sides, are we taking a stance that says that we'd be better off if they had not done that which we remember, remember them for? Do we really believe we would be better off if slavery was still legal in the United States? If we hadn't passed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts of the 1960s? If South Africa still had an apartheid government? I believe we sell ourselves short if we fall into this trap. I'm not saying this to excuse historical figures. Rather, I think the real risk lies in what we choose to do today. The goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all is a tall order. And if we believe that any great leader with flaws is to be demeaned, what do we tell ourselves about what we should do? Since we know of our own shortcomings and imperfections, do we decide to do nothing because we can't do everything? The perfect really can be an enemy of the good. When I was turning 50 a few years ago, well, okay, almost 20 years ago, <laughs> um, I, I started to read biographies of people who made their greatest contributions after they were 50 years old. Among those people are Benjamin Franklin, Winston Churchill, and Abraham Lincoln. I certainly learned enough to know of their flaws, but they inspired me not because of their flaws, but because of what they did accomplish, which in all cases took decades before they achieved those accomplishments. When I think of environmental justice, I can't help but think that this is the biggest existential problem that humanity has ever faced. It can be overwhelming. How do I find environmental hope? I challenge myself to remember that great progress can be achieved even by imperfect leaders. This progress doesn't come all at once. A sequence of partial solutions by imperfect people can eventually result in transformation. I remind myself that I can make my own meaningful contribution without having to be perfect. Just as importantly, I challenge myself to see the good in others who are making meaningful contributions despite their flaws. I'll often recognize that, that those flaws I see in them are usually flaw, flaw, flaws that I have fought to overcome in myself, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so. So I cut myself some slack at the same time as I cut others some slack, and I look forward with environmental hope that we can succeed because I know that imperf we imperfect beings have made significant progress before, despite our individual shortcomings. So this morning's reading is from the Reverend Theodore Parker. Uh, Theodore Parker lived during the first half of the 19th century in Eastern Massachusetts. His theological legacy in Unitarian Universalism is somewhat controversial because um, he changed his mind a whole lot, but it can be said that he was a Unitarian and a Transcendentalist. He served our congregation in West Roxbury, and then he went on to preach for crowds of thousands at Boston Music Hall. This reading is an excerpt from one of those large crowd sermons in 1852. It is titled, Of Justice and the Conscience. The majority of men who think have an ideal justice better than the things around them, juster than the law. Some painted behind them on the crumbling walls of history and tell us of the good old times. Others painted before them on the morning mist of youthful life and in their prayer and in the daily toil strive after this, their new Jerusalem. We, all of us, have this ideal. Our dream is fairer than our day. We will not let it go. If the wicked prosper, it is but for a moment, we say. The counsel of the forge shall be carried headlong. What an ideal democracy now floats before the eyes of earnest and religious men fairer than the Republic of Plato and Moore's Utopia, the golden age of fabled memory. 
It is justice that we want to organize, justice for all, for the rich and for the poor. There shall be slave free from his master. There shall be no want, no oppression, no fear of man, no fear of God, but only love. There is a good time coming, so we all believe when we are young and full of life and healthy hope. God has made man in the instinctive love of justice in him, which gradually gets developed in the world, but in himself justice is infinite. The justice of God must appear in the world and in the history of men, and after all the wrongs that patient merit of the unworthy takes, still you see that the plowshare of justice is drawn through and through the field of the world, uprooting the savage plants. Look at the facts of the world. You can see a continual progressive triumph of the right. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe, the arc is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight, but I can divine it by conscience. But from what I see, I am sure that it bends towards justice. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. <laughs>
Theodore Parker is a compelling character in our religious history. As I mentioned earlier, his legacy was a little mixed because he changed his mind a whole lot. In my reading of his history, what, what I see there is that he got in on the ground floor of a theological movement, and then that movement became widely accepted, and then there was a new idea, and he got into that thing, and then that became widely accepted, and then another new idea. There's just a lot going on at that time, and he was a, it was an an interested and curious man. He wasn't single-handedly responsible for launching any of those theological movements. If you ever have trouble falling asleep and you want to know all about that, give me a call and I'll tell you about all the different nuances in theology of the 19th century. But you probably don't want that. I, don't worry, we're not going to do that. That was <laughs> It's not what we're going to do. Um, Theodore Parker, though, had a knack for finding things that were interesting and compelling and going to be um, you know, something that caught people's imaginations. The 19th century was a booming time of new ideas and liberal theologians, all of them, they were keen to try out new combinations of standard theology with new scientific understandings and political understandings, just putting it all together, new pieces to the puzzle. And that's part of what's happening in Of Justice and the Conscience, that sermon expert that I shared. Um, congratulations to the four of you whose eyes did not glaze over. I'm sorry, I won't do that again. I'll probably do that again. But in that, in that sermon, Theodore Parker is attempting to use popular science to demonstrate that justice was a force in the universe that could be observed and measured in a manner similar to gravity. Earlier in the sermon, he describes how an object falls at a faster rate each second that it falls. And similarly, he concludes that justice builds up over time. In his opinion, this was because humanity was designed with an innate bias towards justice, and our cumulative actions are more just than our individual actions. What appears to be a world of injustice at any given time is actually more just than it once was, and it will be exponentially more just in the future. That's his thesis. He also cites the end of British tyranny as a bold example of how everything was getting better all the time. And now America was free to become that new Jerusalem, better than Plato's Republic and better than Milton's Utopia. The moral arc of the universe was bending, however imperceptible from his vantage point. He couldn't see it, but he could feel it. He knew it was there. And that is what people know from the sermon. They know that quote. It was used by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr during the Civil Rights Movement. It was used again by President Barack Obama when he was on the campaign trail. Both of them switched the words around a little bit. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It's kind of a paraphrase, but this is the, uh, the original here. It doesn't change the sentiment to paraphrase it like that. And they selected that quote because this sermon, and that quote specifically, helped bend the arc of the universe toward the abolition of slavery and they saw themselves and their work as a continuation of that process. At this point in Parker's career, the hot new idea that fascinated him was abolition. Specifically, Parker had become interested in contemporary thinkers who were pointing out the glaring inconsistency of a nation that touts itself as a bastion of freedom free from the tyranny of Britain while having an economy that is, import is supported entirely by slavery. 
Those two do not make sense together. And the hypocrisy was not lost on him. And one of the goals of this sermon was to bring people to that same realization using both popular science and political theory. One of the things that Parker is best known for outside of that quote is his resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Parker, along with Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, other luminaries from our history, opposed the act. Parker actually harbored a fugitive named Ellen Craft in his own home. And just as an aside, Ellen Craft went on to write about her escape from slavery, it involved her passing as a white man to get away to New England, it is worth a read, a fascinating, extraordinary woman. And the legend is that Parker had her stowed away in his house and he went so far to protect her that he kept a pistol in the pulpit at our church in Roxbury, just in case he needed to defend her from bounty hunters. But here's the kicker. To my knowledge, and if what they say in the academy is true, Theodore Parker never once used that pulpit to speak out against slavery the same pulpit in which he had placed that pistol. He harbored Ellen Craft, but he didn't take the opportunity to use the pulpit for abolition. He waited until he had moved on to those large crowd engagements. I don't mean to say that Parker was pro-slavery until the cool kids were anti-slavery. He was known for changing his mind when he discovered an argument that he found compelling that doesn't mean that he is insincere in his embrace in the new. He learned something, he changed his mind. And I think that it speaks well of him that his thoughts and his beliefs were malleable. You know, that's what we're trying to do, right? As Unitarian Universalists, be open to change when we learn or experience something new. His actions indicate that he was pro-abolition or at least anti-slavery before he began publicly condemning slavery. He harbored Ellen Craft in 1849, a year before the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. Why didn't he speak out? Why didn't he speak out against slavery while he was harboring her in his home? I've been to that church. The house is like 100 yards away. Why, why would he not speak out? Well, the church was funded by wealthy mill owners, as were a lot of our New England churches. Mills, cotton mills. People tend to think of slavery as the legacy of the South, but where do you think all that cotton went? It went to New England to be milled into fabric. And Parker's livelihood and the entire parish were dependent on the financial contributions of wealthy mill owners. So although I think it's reasonable to conclude that Parker was opposed to slavery prior to the Fugitive Slave Act, and the evidence was that he harbored Ellen Craft prior to that, it, it cannot be forgotten that he didn't say a word about it while he was the minister of our church in West Roxbury. And yet, Parker made a sizable contribution to the abolition movement, namely through that sermon and others. He started off a little mealy mouth and he let fear overrule his conscience for a while, but he got there. He got there eventually. His previous failures are not excused, they don't go away, but neither is the good that he did tarnished by that truth. The good that a person does is not erased when they do bad, and also the bad things do not erase the good. The two coexist. And thank goodness for that. Like Parker, all of us are complicit and complacent in the ills of the day. We benefit from systems of injustice. Everybody does. And it doesn't mean that we are bad people. But it means we have work to do. We are called to act in accordance with our Unitarian Universalist principles, values, and commitments. And we often get that right, but we have failed. And we will fail again. It's the nature of our species. And one of the most prevalent examples of this is the climate crisis. 
every aspect of our lives is impacted by climate change, and climate change is impacted by every aspect of our lives. The climate crisis intersects with every form of oppression because the oppressed are disproportionately affected. Some of that is by design, right? Think of clear cutting of indigenous lands for cattle grazing in the Amazon. Think of dumping toxic waste on indigenous lands all across this continent. Mountaintop removal mining in Appalachia, fracking in the Michigan basin, the sacrifice zone at Eight Mile. When people mean less, it's easier to destroy their immediate environment. And now that's catching up with the rest of the world. And we all feel the weight of that. We all feel the weight of the climate crisis, although some have disproportionately heavy loads and have been carrying it longer. It is a massive burden for each one of us. And the grief that we feel about that is real. We have every reason and every right to be exhausted and depressed about the state of our climate. But here's the thing, anybody can feel exhausted and depressed, and everyone should to a point, but that's not all there is to the story, not for us. We're Unitarian Universalists, and that means something. We have to do something other than what everybody else can do. We have a unique perspective to offer to the world on every issue, but especially on this issue. What the world needs is twofold. First, we need practical solutions. We need to reduce how much we own and how much we consume. We need to break our addiction to fossil fuels. We need composting, green energy, all of that. We know that. Everybody here knows that. We need action. You use are very good at that. But second, what the world needs is hope can't do any of that other stuff if you're in despair. What the world needs is hope. Not hope in some kind of divine intervention or those mealy mouth platitudes that it's all going to fix itself or we're going to move to Mars, the next generation will figure it out. That is not hope. That is not hope. At best, it is empty and at its worst, it is placing the burden of action elsewhere. That is not hope. That is false comfort. It has no value. What we need is real hope, weighty, comforting, fierce, durable, tough hope. A hope that is tethered to reality and that is grounded in history. Our Unitarian Universalist faith is a source of that real, true hope, that weighty hope. For us, this is not a matter of faith, and it is not a matter of action. This is a matter of faith and action. I would go so far to say a matter of faith in action. Like Parker and so many others before us, we have a message to share of another day, another world that is not distant or other. Our universalist forebears believe they could create that world right here and now through the labors of their hands. Our Unitarian forebears believe they could do it too through self-improvement and refinement of thought. And for that matter, our humanists know this world too as a place where all of humanity is treated with respect and dignity and has the opportunity to thrive. And that we are responsible for doing that. Unitarian Universalists are not content to wait for another place and another time where things are perfect. That place is here. That time is now. There is nothing else but here and now. And it gets closer every second of every day. Things will be okay because they have to be okay and because we're doing our parts to make them okay. We have the capacity to create justice in this world. Our cumulative actions are greater than our individual failures. Like Parker, we have all been a little mealy mouth from time to time, but there is hope for us to make good yet. The unique role of Unitarian Universalists in addressing the climate crisis is this hope, this real hope. Things are scary. Things are bleak. Working for environmental justice or to offset the climate crisis is a confrontation with 
the greatest existential threat our species has ever faced. It is exhausting. That does not excuse us from doing the work. We have a history of upending seemingly intractable, intractable problems through belief in our ability to create that different world right here and right now. We've done that before. We just keep doing it. The arc is long. I do believe that it bends towards justice. Like Parker, I can't see the arc, and from where I stand, sometimes it looks like a trick of the mind to me. Maybe it's just a straight line. But I, I look over the story of humanity, and I see that we have always been on a path of justice and improvement from our earliest history. I would rather live now than at any other point in time. That's how I know, deep down, I do believe things are on a positive trajectory. So the arc must indeed bend. It must actually be an arc, not a straight line. I do believe that it bends towards justice. The mistakes that we make and that we have made, although serious, can be outweighed by the good that we do. So let's keep going. May it be so. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join us in singing Rising Green, number 1068. <laughs> as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen.